Free Speech Night. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I think this is the first speech night in a long time where we actually have good weather. So you weren't getting rained on or blown as you were moving from your car to the auditorium. Thank goodness. Thanks also to those who are coming to speech night rather than watching the Cal Bears play Arizona State. Thank you, thank you for being here. Every semester, the speech department puts on speech night. And one of our main reasons is to give you a good example of what your speech team is doing for you on campus, and also give you examples of speeches you'll be doing in your class as well. But we also feel as a speech department that it's important to do this so that you really understand the significance of the speech team here on campus. Uh, excuse me. Uh, hello. What, so what's the score? Oh, okay. Thank you. The game doesn't start for 15 more minutes. But at this time, if you'll all check those beeping, bleeping items that you might have with you, and put them on um, vibrate or silence, it will be much appreciated. The history of the speech team here on campus, it goes back to the 1920s. This is actually the first competitive team that Modesto Junior College had here. And the team is a team that through the 1920s and up to the current times, has been a college that ranked first in the entire nation in speeches. And continuously, as you will find out this evening, we have nationally award-winning students here on campus on the speech team and debating. And so we're extremely proud of the history that we have over the years. And I'll be introducing you to those nationally award-winning speakers. We also are very honored this evening to have a former speech team member who went on to University of Pacific that I'll be introducing you to a little bit later as well. But what I'd like to do right now is to let you see who will be representing you throughout the semester at our Northern California Championship Tournament, our state tournament and national tournament, your spring 2010 speech team. Our first individual is Elizabeth Alvarado. <laughs> Philip Acevedo. James Burlew, Richard Burlew, Robert Burlew, almost the entire Burlew family, V. Bowen, Eric Brown, Sarah Clark. Stephanie Cox, Kristen Harper, Morgan Knox Goodman, Jimmy Mack, Ashley Mayfield, Jessica Medina, Serena Moreno, Mark Morrow, Paris Player, Danielle Ramos, James Sanders, Timothy Shaw, 
George Julius Theodore. Nathaniel Walden. Josh Ward. Emily Vang. Your favorite, Michelle Yandel. Chris Yerzy. And last but certainly not least, Eddie Zapeta. Please give a big round of applause for your 2010 Spring Speech Team. Now certainly the excellence that we have on this team, as you will notice as I'm introducing these individuals, the excellence that they have achieved certainly is not just because of my efforts. And I'd like to strongly thank my colleagues who help the team at times when my efforts are stretched thin. Individuals like Kim Duran, Charles Mullins, Dr. Jim Salmon and Alan McKissick, I thank you very much for the time you give outside of classes to our students to help them achieve. And then finally tonight, I'd also like to make a, a strong effort to thank the sponsors that you see in your program and encourage you to use their services. And if you do, please let them know that you saw their advertisement in the speech team program when you came. So I'd like to thank them as well. But first off, we'll now get into the speeches. For many of you within your speech 100 or 102 classes, but even the persuasion and the debate and argumentation classes, we all have to think on an informative type of level and present information so that it's clearly understood and grasped. The informative speech is really a speech that introduces you to a concept or an idea so that it broadens your knowledge as well. The individual giving this speech was not an individual that you saw come up on stage as well. Her name is Jennifer Ramirez. And Jennifer was a two-year competitor for the Modesto Junior College speech team. While she was here at Modesto Junior College, she was one of the very first individuals who was doing platform speeches, was doing the interpretation events, as well as the debate events. Probably her highest achievement here with the speech team was coming in third place with her partner in parliamentary team debate in the entire nation. Jennifer then went on to University of Pacific. But what I am most proud of with Jennifer is not only did she go on to University of Pacific, but because of her work on the speech team, the UOP speech team wanted her so badly that they gave her a full ride scholarship to the University of Pacific. This spring she'll be graduating with no debt. And I think that's pretty dang awesome. So please give a big round of applause for Ms. Jennifer Ramirez. character Bam Bam Rubble is known for his amazing strength. As an infant, Bam Bam had no trouble helping his parents with small chores around the house, such as picking up furniture or serving as a jack for their vehicles. And while Betty and Barney Rubble's baby seems to possess unviable strength, three-year-old Liam Polkstra would give Bam Bam a run for his money. According to CTV News from May 30, 2007, Liam has the kind of physical attributes that bodybuilders and other athletes dream about. 40% more muscle mass than normal, jaw-dropping strength, breathtaking quickness, a speedy metabolism, and almost no body fat. The source of his amazing physique? 
a rare genetic disorder called myostatin-related muscle hypertrophy. And unlocking the secrets to this disorder could lead to treatments and cures for muscle wasting diseases, such as HIV, which according to Overt.org's last updated August 6, 2009, affects over 2 million people worldwide. According to the Muskegon Chronicle from January 1, 2009, myostatin-related muscle hypertrophy promotes above-average growth of the skeletal muscles without harming the heart or causing any known negative side effects. However, it could also lead to the new era of illegal drug use among athletes looking for a competitive edge. Myostatin-related muscle hypertrophy could ultimately unlock the human body's best self. So today, we will strengthen our knowledge about this unfamiliar genetic disorder. Next, we will discuss the benefits and drawbacks unlocking this research offers before finally looking into the implications unlocking this disorder brings. But before we can discuss the implications, we must first understand what this disorder is. <coughs> to do this, we will first look at the science behind myostatin-related muscle hypertrophy before looking into some known cases. According to Genetics Home Reference Online last updated December 2008, myostatin-related muscle hypertrophy is a rare condition characterized by reduced body fat and increased muscle size. Affected individuals have up to two times the normal amount of muscle mass in their bodies and tend to have increased strength. This disorder works by suppressing the protein which normally restrains muscle growth. According to an article by Dr. Katherine Wagner last updated April 30, 2009, MSTN, also known as myostatin, is the only gene known to be associated with this disorder. People News posted July 20, 2009, tells us that this disorder is caused by mutations in the MSTN gene, and instructions for making myostatin are provided by this gene. This protein is active in skeletal muscles, and it's used for movement for both before and after birth. But normally, muscle growth is restrained by this protein. Due to this, the growth of muscles is very limited. However, myostatin-related muscle hypertrophy represses this protein, permitting muscles to grow unrestrained. Sounds like a dream come true. And the way it is, because according to the previously cited article by Dr. Katherine Wagner, she tells us that this disorder has no known medical complications, and those with the disorder are intellectually normal. The previously cited Pugel News tells us that the production of functional myostem is reduced by mutations and leads to muscle tissue overgrowth. The pattern of inheritance for this disorder is called incomplete autosomal dominance. People having a mutation in one or in both copies of the MSTN gene in each cell have increased muscle mass and increased muscle growth respectively. This disorder is also very rare. Only a handful of cases have been documented in humans, with the first being a German boy in 2000. However, according to the previously cited CTV news, myostatin-related muscle hypertrophy, hypertrophy was first documented in beef cattle and mice in the late 1990s. But perhaps the best known and most documented case of this disorder is that of three-year-old Liam Hoekstra. Tina Kells tells us April 1, 2009, that Liam has been dubbed by some as the world's strongest boy, and he looks like any other kid his age, until you ask him to lift some weights or do some sit-ups. The TLC documentary aired June 10, 2009, tells us that the world's strongest toddler does not have a soft, baby look to his body, and has very little body fat. In other words, this little kid is buff. So now that we know what this disorder is, and some of the best known cases, we can now look to the benefits and drawbacks unlocking this disorder could bring. The potential for this research is tremendous and can help millions of people worldwide overcome awful diseases that claim many lives every day. Future obtainable benefits include cures and treatments for muscular dystrophy, treatments for cancer, heart failure, and HIV. According to the previously cited of Earth.org, the estimated number of deaths from HIV alone was 2 million worldwide in 2007. So this research has the potential to save the lives of almost half a million children worldwide living with HIV globally. Not to mention, millions of others suffering from the aforementioned muscle-wasting diseases. And as amazing as this research potential is, it does have its drawbacks. When we look back to Liam, his mother, Dana, tells us that he's always hungry and eats large quantities of food. Six full meals a day, to be exact. 
Since Liam has very little body fat and, fat and does not gain weight easily, he needs constant nutrition in order to keep precious fat in the places his body needs most, like his brain. Without adequate body fat, a child's growth can be stunted and the central nervous system can be impaired. So Liam has to eat constantly in order to keep himself healthy. But hey, who doesn't love to eat, right? According to the previously cited CTV News, another drawback we're likely to encounter is that this research could become a hot commodity among athletes, looking to gain an edge, perhaps legally among the competition. In an interview, Dr. Erlen Larson, an internist at Hackley Hospital, stated that this research has the potential for great abuse in the future as a new steroid. And as we've seen through recent history, there is nothing athletes are not willing to do in order to perfect their bodies. So now that we understand what this disorder is and its potential benefits and drawbacks, we can now look at future implications, as implications that this research offers. The previously cited CTV News tells us that a condition like Liam's is more than a medical rarity and could help scientists unlock the secrets of muscle growth and muscle deterioration. If researchers can learn how to control and use myostatin, this protein could become a powerful weapon in the pharmaceutical arsenal. Presently, there are no known cures for muscular dystrophy. The National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke, last Axis, August 31, 2009, states that the muscular dystrophies are a group of more than 30 genetic diseases characterized by progressive weakness and degeneration of the skeletal muscles that control movement. Right now, the only treatment available for these individuals includes physical, respiratory, and speech therapy, along with orthopedic appliances used for support as well as corrective orthopedic surgery. Duchenne and Becker muscular dystrophy alone affect 400 to 600 live male births each year in the United States. Being able to control myostem could lead us to a cure for muscular dystrophy, and doing so would give many children their lives back. Currently, John Hopkins Hospital is researching myostatin-related muscle hypertrophy and has found 100 adult participants. The goal is to find new treatments for muscular dystrophy patients. The CBS website from April 2nd, 2009, tells us that scientists actually hope to figure out how to mimic this disorder to help treat people suffering from muscle wasting diseases. Another possibility? Designer babies. According to the article, Genetic Inequality, Human Genetic Engineering by Dr. Daniel Simmons, published December 2008, Ongoing advances make it increasingly likely that scientists will someday be able to genetically engineer humans to possess certain desired traits. And with genetic screening, screenings and sport recruitments going on right now, a couple wanting an athletic child can simply choose to design their baby with myostatin-related muscle hypertrophy. And while much controversy has stemmed from gene therapy, it is a possibility and a hard fact to ignore. But with the advances in science, myostatin-related muscle hypertrophy has amazing possibilities. So today, we have, we have strengthened our knowledge about this unfamiliar genetic disorder. We then looked at potential benefits and drawbacks before finally looking into the implications. And although this might seem small now, we can recall even the smallest things, like Velcro, for example, can change the world. And although Liam would probably lose to Bam Bam in an arm wrestling contest, unlocking the secrets to this disorder could help millions of children suffering from muscle-wasting diseases accomplish feats that they never even dreamed of. Our next event for you is an event that certainly, again, for the argumentation, debate classes, we ask you to think on your feet. In your speech 100 or 102 classes, your instructor might ask you to do an impromptu speech. A speech that's done off the top of your head. In competition, our students are expected to have a time frame of seven minutes. And during that seven minutes, they take some time to prepare, and they then speak and give their speech. In competition, usually the breakdown is about two minutes for preparation and five minutes for speaking. 
So the individual that will be giving your impromptu speech this evening is Mr. Chris Yersey, who is an individual who last year came in third place in the entire nation in parliamentary team debate. So please give a round of applause for Mr. Chris Yersey. Now, the other thing with the impromptu speech is over the years of doing speech nights where you're people who say, hey, that's a canned speech. He knew exactly what his topics were going to be. You, you, you just gave them to him. And I say, no, no. OK, how can we change this so that people truly believe that these topics are coming from the moment? So we then look for audience participation. We decided, well, if you guys get to choose the topics that Chris has to choose one of those to speak from, then we realize that he's doing it off the top of his head. So I'm now opening the floor for three different topics. The first topic that I'm looking for might be a name of a politician. So Obama. John Edwards. All right. Uh, because Obama, I think, is too popular, I'm going to go with John Edwards because I think that's more obscure. So, <laughs> John Edwards. Now, a feeling. Jealousy. Jealousy. There we go. And now, a little bit more difficult, maybe, maybe not, a movie quotation. I'll be back. I'll be back. And so now in the front row, we have an individual who helps our team out, Mr. Jacob Holman, who will be giving time signals to Chris so that he knows how much time he's used. And when Chris is ready, he will give us your speech. Ditka once said, coffee is the lifeblood that drives the dreams of champions. Now, I'm not sure if coffee really does that, because I'm not a coffee drinker, but I do know that one thing that does fuel dreams is hope. And when we think of politicians, that is exactly what we think of. Now, I know Obama kind of overused the whole hope thing, uh, kind of made it a common topic, but I think hope really is what drives these people. We talked about a politician. Someone with John Edwards, uh, his name recognition and his caliber, uh, this is somebody who spent their entire life 
working on this. And the only thing that can drive you in that lifelong passion is hope. So we're going to look at hope today, and we're going to analyze the three different things of hope and how this all applies to Jonathan Edwards. First, we're going to look at people who don't have hope. And we're going to see that there are some people who don't have hope, and they really just don't know what's going on. They, they kind of go around and just blown around by the winds of life. But second, we're going to look at people who also don't have hope, but they let that hope and that lack of hope bring them down. And then finally, we're going to see the people who do have hope. We're going to see the power that is found in hope. So first, we look at people who don't have hope, and we see how they just get blown around. You know, there's this story uh, of a paratrooper, someone who's going to the military to jump out of airplanes. And he's really excited to do this, what he's always wanted to do. And so he goes to boot camp and he does his training and stuff from the tower. And then finally he's going to make his first jump from the airplane. The instructor tells him, here's what you're going to do. First of all, you're going to get on the plane and fly up there. When the light turns green, you're going to jump out of the plane. You're going to count to 10 and pull the parachute. When you get to the ground, the truck will take you back to the base and we'll, we'll debrief there. So the guy's all excited, he gets up, gets in the airplane, flies up there, the light turns green, and he jumps out of the plane. He counts to 10, and he pulls on the chute. And of course, nothing happens. He goes like, oh, that's not good. So he pulls on his reserve chute, and again, nothing happens. Now the first thing he thinks of at that point is great, I bet the truck's not even gonna be there. <laughs> this is the kind of person who doesn't have hope, and he lets it just, he doesn't even get it. He doesn't know what's going on in his life. And he's just kind of going with the winds of change with what goes on in life. And you can see the, the lack of ability there to, to cope with situations. Uh, and Jonathan Edwards certainly did not have that. He certainly faced opposition and was a very uh, viable contender to win the President of the United States in that position. Uh, it, it definitely, he was a very uh, confident man and, and was confident in his hope. But secondly, we see the people who don't have hope and they let it bring them down. And they get overwhelmed by these things. Uh, and often what happens here is you get an overreaction. Uh, you've probably all heard about Andrew Jackson and um, Charles Dickens and the duel they had. It was a very interesting situation where Charles Dickens insulted the wife of Andrew Jackson, which normally is not a good idea, but with Andrew Jackson, he took it very personally, and he challenged Charles Dickens to a duel to the death. Now, they go to do this, and uh, you know, Charles Dickens shoots Andrew Jackson, who doesn't quite die, and he ends up shooting Charles Dickens, and he dies, and what you have is a classic case of overreaction. And it's interesting, the fact that he didn't have hope caused him to do that. He didn't hope, have hope in the faithfulness of his wife, or in the integrity of his wife, or in the fact that Charles Dickens was you know, just an author, he wasn't the president, he wasn't all of these things, and he couldn't trust his wife with that hope. And he really let it bring him down, and we see the overreaction from that. So let's finally finish and talk about people who do have hope. And I think this is a powerful thing, a very powerful thing. We all saw what happened with President Obama and how that worked out. But even aside from that, they've actually done scientific tests to study the power of hope. And it's interesting what they did is they took some, a couple of lab rats and they put them in a pot of water, which is not terribly ethical, but they decided to do it anyway. So they leave them in there for a while, and they're just swimming around, and after about 10 minutes, they start to the falter, and they start to go underwater. Well, at that point, they pull them out, and they give them a whole day's rest, and they feed them, and all that good stuff. And the next day, they put those same lab rats back in that same pot of water, and for the next three hours, those lab rats swam there, waiting, because they knew that just like yesterday, they would be rescued. And that is the power of hope. You see, power, the power of hope is that it overcomes those situations where not only can you be going through life and you have these dreams to be the president, and then you have those dreams and you can fulfill those dreams, but when you hit hard times, you can realize with that hope you have, it gets you through those hard times, and it can take you to places like Jonathan Edwards, where he's a nationally known politician, everybody knows who he is, and he's got some power in Congress, and it can get you to that position even when we have to deal with the hard times uh, that he has had to go through in his life. So now, even though the program says we're going to listen to a persuasive speech next, I actually have to set up the very last presentation that you'll be watching. 
And that's the parliamentary debate. For those in 107, parliamentary debate is one of the main assignments that you'll be doing. And for those of you who aren't taking a debate class, then this might be your first look at what parliamentary debate is all about. Parliamentary debate came about because we wanted students to be able to show that they could critically think on their feet, just like the impromptu speech. So what a parliamentary debate does is, in a debate tournament, there are six rounds of debate. And in parliamentary debate, that means there are going to be six different topics that the debaters are going to be debating at a certain tournament. They receive their topic 20 minutes before they're going to give the actual debate. And during that 20 minutes, then, is their opportunity to put their arguments together and their ideas together and organize their speech before they then come together for the debate to actually do it. So this evening, because for two years I've had Richard and Robert Berlou participate in parliamentary debate, and we've done it in such a way where we've given them the topic beforehand so they could organize it for all of you to present a really strong debate. I thought, well, this is their fourth time up here. And so let's give them an opportunity to do parliamentary debate the way that they do it at tournaments and to give them a topic and give them 20 minutes. And so this evening, if I could have the four debaters come up on stage, the first thing that I'll let you know is that on the affirmative side, we are going to have Richard and Robert Berlou, who are the national champions in parliamentary debate. And on the opposition side, we have Josh Ward, who also took third place in the nation in parliamentary team debate and his partner, Sarah Clark. And in this envelope, I have the resolution that they will be debating at the end of this performance. This house believes that a handout is better than a helping hand. This house believes that a handout is better than a helping hand. We'll see you in 20 minutes. The next speech that we have for you, again, for those of you in speech 100, and 102, you'll be expected to present a persuasive speech. Also, for those of you in speech 110, persuasion, that's what, this is what your class is all about. And again, in argumentation and debate, this is what we're hoping that you're focused on, is how to persuade your audience to believe your point of view. A persuasive speech is just that, a speech where you're trying to persuade the audience. In my class as a speech instructor, I basically say that chances are in a persuasive speech, you're not going to completely change someone's point of view. You can't expect them to completely change from A to B in just 10 minutes. But I say a good persuasive speaker is an individual who can make you think and consider their point of view. And so this evening, that's what I've asked Ms. Jessica Medina to do just for you. So please give a round of applause to Ms. Jessica Medina. Every day, we are faced with making decisions. And regardless of how big or small they may be, there are always repercussions. Most of the time, we understand the consequences of our decisions. For example, eating fast food every day isn't going to get us into that pair of skinny jeans we keep in our closet. However, 
There are decisions that most of us make every day that will likely have hidden dire consequences. And many of you may be surprised that this silent killer, known to alleviate discomfort and rid ourselves of pain, is found in nearly every medicine cabinet across America. We know them as prescription drugs. The Department of Health and Human Services state that one half of all Americans take at least one prescription drug. According to the medical report, Death by Medicine, more than 100,000 people in the United States die every year from prescription drugs. Americans need to kick their dependency on prescription drugs. I will first provide reasoning as to why prescription drugs are dangerous. Second, I will emphasize what causes Americans to become dependent on them. And finally, I'll provide solutions to solve this growing crisis. To begin with, it's important that we understand just how dangerous prescription drugs truly are. Most of us are aware that all prescription drugs come with side effects, but there is no way of knowing if one will experience something as small as dry mouth or as serious as a heart attack. According to the organization Pro-Liberty, a woman shared her horror story while taking the prescription drug Prozac. Instead of experiencing headaches and fatigue, Vicki Baker was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis and chronic pain syndrome caused by the use of Prozac. Correspondingly, on October 5, 2009, World Health and Online Network stated that 51% of FDA-approved drugs have serious adverse effects that have not been detected prior to approval, and that each year, prescription drugs injure 1.5 million people so severely that they require hospitalization. The San Francisco Chronicle published a story on a 16-year-old that was diagnosed with cancer and went through months of painful chemotherapy. But she described her experience with cancer to be nothing compared to taking the prescription drug Paxil. This antidepressant sent this teen into the emergency room for attempted suicide caused by using the drug. And it's not just side effects we need to be concerned about, but taking prescription drugs can easily lead to drug abuse for many Americans. The United States National Library of Medicine from October 8, 2009, estimate that 20% of people use prescription drugs for non-medical reasons, such as pain relievers, stimulants, and even sedatives to get through their day. In fact, the Office of National Drug Control Policy declares that in the past year, abuse of prescription painkillers now ranks second only behind marijuana, the nation's most prevalent drug problem. And it's not just adults that are abusing these drugs. Adolescents are now seeking their next high, not as much on the street corner, but in medicine cabinets at home. For instance, the Federal Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration state that every day, 2,500 kids ages 12 to 17 abuse a prescription painkiller for the first time. Finally, Prescription drugs are often lethal. The Journal of the American Medical Association revealed that pharmaceutical drugs kill more people every year than those that are killed in traffic accidents. In fact, the Center for Disease Control, last updated February 9, 2007, reported a 62.5% increase in deaths due to prescription drug overdoses. And Stephen Fried, author of Bitter Pills Inside the Hazardous World of Legal Drugs, believes that the worst thing that can happen to you when you take a legal drug is not that it won't work, but that you may drop dead. Now that we understand the dangers of prescription drugs, we need to examine what is causing Americans to become so dependent on them. In our fast-paced society, we demand immediate solutions to all problems, and prescription drugs have fulfilled that need. Psychologist Thomas Lippitt suggests that our society operates under the quick-fix mentality due to our frustration tolerance level being very low. And according to the National Institute on Drug Safety, September 9, 2009, stress is the number one reason for taking prescription drugs. Moreover, Dr. Jennifer Legat on November 16, 2009, stated that many are quick to look for the easiest way to deal with stress by running to their doctors, hoping to get pills that will save them from their troubling emotions. Now, people with a quick fix mentality think that most things can be solved quickly and easily if you just find the right solution. And this is mostly because of contemporary marketing that always point towards a quick fix or an instant gratification, which leads to the next cause. Drug companies are more concerned with marketing their products than the benefits to consumer well-being. Ray Strand, 
author of Death by Prescription, state that pharmaceutical companies spend billions of dollars on direct-to-consumer advertising. Following this further, as of December 2008, the Wall Street Journal claimed that 60% of the drug advertisements in medical journals actually violated FDA guidelines. According to Bern Goldberg's book, Alternative Medicine, paid pharmaceutical advertisements are the main funding source for the Journal of the American Medical Association and the American Psychological Association. And while consumers can only obtain prescriptions for these drugs from their doctors, doctors end up writing the exact prescription as seen advertised more than 70% of the time because of the manipulative and misleading marketing tactics that drug companies publish in doctors' medical journals. Beyond that, the Federal Drug Administration, or FDA, lacks proper follow-up and adequate testing with prescription drugs. The Government Accountability Office, as of October 26, 2009, found that the FDA allows drugs to stay on the market even when follow-up studies found that they were not effective. This proves that the FDA is either not adequately testing prescription drugs prior to putting them on the market, or the follow-up process is not being taken seriously. For instance, Eureka was introduced to the market through FDA's accelerated approval in 2004 in hopes of treating cancer. And while Eureka has failed to show any significant survival benefits for its patients to date, the FDA still has not taken this drug off the market. Finally, we must stop the cycle of dependence by implementing these alternative strategies to solve this growing crisis. The immediate action we must take is how to govern our own health. Dr. Elaine Moore, author of Treatment Resources, stated on December 12, 2009, that today, more than ever, personal health responsibility is an essential step in disease prevention. Taking responsibility includes monitoring both the benefits and side effects of prescription drugs and talking to your doctor about concerns you have. But it doesn't just stop there. An involved parent requires you to educate before you medicate your child. Parents need to monitor not only the prescription drugs children take, but the drugs that we keep in our medicine cabinets. Additionally, drug manufacturers must be forced to redesign their marketing tactics. Since medical journals are so dependent on marketing from pharmaceutical companies, Chief Executive of United Health, Richard Smith, recommends that pharmaceutical, com that pharmaceutical companies ban publications amongst clinical trials and new drugs, and instead, the protocols and results should be made available on regulated websites. As for consumers, a New York Times article from July 27, 2009, report that Congress is currently imposing a $37 billion tax on drug makers for denying deductions on prescription drug advertising, as well as enforcing the Public Health Protection Act, which will prohibit direct-to-consumer marketing of prescription drugs. The final solution is to strengthen the FDA's ability to regulate. On February 26, 2009, Health and Science Editor Maggie Fox stated that the Government Accountability Office is currently working with the Obama administration to include the FDA's reform in the new health care budget. But the FDA is not going to do this on their own. We must follow the recommendations on drug safety. First. The FDA authority should be more expanded and exercised through pre-approval trials and studies. Rapid approvals need to stop coming at the expense of the public safety. Second, the event reporting system must be improved, which will increase the involvement of the FDA's ability to regulate and talk to doctors as well as consumers. Today, I have shared reasons why prescription drugs are dangerous, emphasized what causes Americans to become dependent on them, and finally, provide solutions to solve this significant problem. Every day, we are faced with making decisions. And like Alfred Montepart once said, nobody ever did or will escape the consequences of one's choices. Americans need to kick their dependency on prescription drugs. They are not the quick solution to our problems. 100,000 people die from them every year. And today, we have the ability to change that statistic. We have the resources and opportunities in this nation to stop this growing epidemic. We all should make the choice. The choice to end addiction, to save lives, and better this country. We need to act now. Thank you. The next
next performance that we have for you changes the public speaking spectrum a little bit. Part of our competition as a speech team has a theatrical flair to it. And that theatrical flair are events that are in the interpretation of literature genre. And so this evening, what we have for you is what's called a duo interpretation, where two individuals take a cutting or cuttings from a play and put it together into a 10-minute program. Now, the difference between interpretation of literature and actually acting is the idea that for an interpreter of literature, they need to have the script in front of them at all times. And then they have to create this character that's believable, but you always see the literature right there in front of you. So sit back and relax and enjoy the oral interpretation duo from Philip Acevedo and Paris Player. Selection by Oliver Lansley, we follow the central character's journey as she is forced to choose between what she wants and what others want for her. Immaculate, Immaculate by Oliver Lansley. The relevant part is that happened well over nine months ago, and Michael is the last person I had sex with. So my condition is somewhat puzzling. I'm pregnant. Hello. Uh, oh, I don't know. Wait a minute. Hello, look. Um, I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to see you today. Something has come up. Right, right. So you were expecting me then? Of course I was. It just slipped my mind. But look, if you were to call to be scheduled. Uh -huh. Well, look, I've come a really long way. I mean, a really <laughs> long way. If I could just come in, sit down, I promise right. you. Right. Come in, put your stuff on the bed, get undressed. I'll be with you in a second. Uh, miss, get undressed. I don't understand what you're Pop saying. Pop your clothes off uh, <laughs> and wash yourself in the sink if you need to. Miss, I want the clothes to stay on. I, what Can are you, you keep about? it in your pants for like one <laughs> second? Miss, miss, I can keep it in my pants. Okay. Thank you. Look, I want you call a lady of the night, mistress, madam, a dominatrix. Shh. <laughs> Miss, I, I think there's been some mistake. I mean, I'm here for the baby. Your baby. Excuse me? Your baby. Oh, I'm sorry, but what are you... It's one of ours. What are you talking about? Ours? Who are you? Oh, I'm sorry. We usually have a procedure for these sort of things. It's just I came in here and you asked me to take my clothes off and... Who are you? I'm sorry. I'm Gabriel. I'm an angel. Uh, the angel. And the baby, it's one of ours. So, you're telling me that 
This baby is... One of the divine, a lamb of God, a child of creation. Ma! <laughs> I... But why would... You have heard of the second coming. I mean, it has been prophesied for some time now. Hang on, second coming? So Jesus is being reincarnated? No, 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 no. We don't do reincarnation. Okay, so how would you describe this then? Uh, that right there is the second coming. Right, just the different words? Look, forgive me for being difficult, but why should I believe you? You got any proof? We don't do proof. It negates the whole faith thing. <laughs> Not even a little miracle. Water into wine? Do you have a better explanation? Well, no, not yet. Well, then you're just going to have to take my word for it. I mean, the conception was immaculate, was it not? Well, it was. I mean, okay. You do know that I'm not a virgin. Huh, right. Well, I could kind of sort. Okay. Okay. But have you had sex in the last nine months? Well, not the kind of sex that's going to get you pregnant. No. Oh. Uh, well, well then, then good. Then it must be God's baby. Well, well, will God be paying child support then? Good evening, I am Lucifer, the Prince of Darkness. Six months ago, there was a momentous night. A night that would change the fate of all mankind. A night when the heavens kissed and the sun blinked. And the fallen angel walked the earth once more. <laughs> I took the body. I had sex with the you. Hence, the baby. <laughs> but, Lucifer, I haven't had sex in over a year. Uh, oh no, to the words, good man, ringing the bells. No, nothing. <coughs> good man. Look, I said I don't know no good men. Wait, good men? Like Gary Goodman? Oh my God, no. You must have drugged me or something, you some kind of black magic or your devil powers. Look, look, look. I didn't mean to seduce you at all. By the time I got to you, you were all over this. <laughs> God, don't let this be true. I wouldn't necessarily have picked you. I don't know how much you drunk by that point, but it was all I could do to get you back to your flag. Gary Goodman, I slept with Gary Goodman. Well, if it's any consolation, you slept with me. No, 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 no. What was I doing? Well, I... Uh, well, is it true? I don't know. You don't know? I think so. You think so? Yes, I'm not sure, and why does it matter? Why? Why? Why does it matter? It matters, Missy, because we need to find out whether that little fella in there is the second coming or the spawn of Satan. Well, surely you should know. I thought you people knew everything. Well, that, that is a good point. <laughs> so don't you know? Well, I guess you could sort of say I'm on a need-to-know basis. And you don't think this is something you need to know? Well, yes, I, I suppose it is. So why don't you ask him? You, you can't just walk up to God and ask him. Why not? Because you just can't. Why not? And then he sends you down here to try to sort things out for him. Uh, look, <laughs> this isn't about me. This it's about you. No, it's not. Uh, did you have sex with Gary Goodman or not? This is ridiculous. This whole thing is ridiculous. ridiculous. I've practically been selling it for the last year. Yeah, How could I be pregnant? So, what do I do now? What happened to pro-choice? Pro-choice? Pro-choice is not I a choice. I don't even have a choice. But then you never do. What if I choose not to have the baby? You cannot do that. You don't even know whose it is yet. What difference does it make? Either way, we'll lead to an apocalypse, and I don't want to be responsible for that. But, but he's your savior. No, he's your savior, the savior of your establishment. We're not perfect. I know I'm not. But you, you can be forgiven. What if we don't want to be forgiven? What if we don't think we've actually done anything wrong? And what is it with you people? 
people. The moment someone shows disillusionment in one camp, you automatically assume they devoted themselves to the other. Did you ever consider that maybe I don't care for either of you? So now we come to our final performance, the parliamentary debate. And once again within parliamentary debate, as with the impromptu speech, there is audience participation. Because basically, parliamentary debate is framed after the British government. And with British government, they have a parliament. And in their parliaments, they get a little bit rowdy and supporting the people that they want to support. And so, this evening, we want you to feel just fine with supporting the people that you support. So once again, for this debate, let me introduce to you on the affirmative side, Richard and Robert Berlou. And then on the opposition side is Josh Ward and Sarah Clark. Now, with the British Parliament, there is always a moderator, or as the British call it, a Speaker of the House, which this evening will be Mr. Chris Yerzy, who will run the debate and take care of any type of problems that happen within the debate. But during the debate, when you hear things that you like, feel free to say, hear, hear so that the debaters know that this is a line of persuasion that maybe they should continue on. But again, sit back and enjoy this parliamentary debate. We will now call this house to order, and we will hear a four-minute speech, a speech not to exceed four minutes, rather, from the Prime Minister. This is really good to hear. I just wanted to describe it real quick. It's like lights in my eyes and dark. It's really cool. Like my mom would be out there and I wouldn't even know. So, okay. This house believes that a handout is better than helping hands. So, we as the government decided to define this in a very clever way. So, as you talk about what we love to talk about most economics. So, let me just describe to you real quick our cleverness. Um, a handout in this case is going to be just giving money and permission. And a helping hand is going to be actually telling people what to do. Okay, so we're going to talk about Congress giving tax credits versus the Federal Reserve giving small business loans. Because currently in Congress, there's a bill being scrutinized, and that's that uh, the Federal Reserve, which is the central bank in America, needs to have more scrutiny and accountability. And so they're saying Congress should get in and be able to decide their actions, whereas right now, it's completely away from Congress. It's, by, it's not... It's not political at all. It's run by economists, purely economists, and it's not something you can vote for, you know, who runs it. It's decided by the elite, right? And so we're going to say that Congress getting in there and telling the Federal Reserve how to run the economy is going to be a very bad idea, and I'm going to describe all the reasons in a few minutes, versus the Federal Reserve being able to do what they do best, which is running it themselves. Congress' tactic is to give tax credits. The Federal Reserve is to give loans. So I just want to make sure that's clear. Go ahead, Josh. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to make sure that uh, we agree that there's actually no accountability whatsoever in the Federal Reserve. They can do anything they want. Yeah, basically. Uh, okay, so let's move on. So the background here is that uh, we're going to say that you know the Federal Reserve is better than Congress no matter what. And the first contention is that Congress is politicized. Now, the first point under this is the special interest, right? Did you guys watch Obama give a State of the Union address? Do you know how many times he referred to special interest screwing everything up? Well, he was just up there whining about why he couldn't get his health care bill passed. But the reality is, special interest groups really do run Congress because they have to react to money which helps their campaigns. 
Special interests are something unique to Congress, but completely separate from the Federal Reserve. There is no access to giving money, you know, to sway or help, you know, get more money for your organization as far as the Federal Reserve is concerned. So they're exempt from special interest groups. Secondly, they're exempt from retards. The reality is Congress is a bunch of politicians, right? And those people don't know, a lot of them don't know any more about economic policy than the average of Joe Smo from the, from the street. And so you have the anything party, and you have the nothing party, and then you have the nothing ever gets done America, right? And the reality is the Federal Reserve is completely away from that. My third point is payback. Okay. In Congress, it's all about my bill versus your bill. I'll put some of your bill on my bill as long as you'll put some of my bill on your bill. And I'll vote for your bill as long as you'll vote for my bill. If you don't know that, then you should try actually participating in any sort of government whatsoever, even if it's student government. It's the exact same way. And the reality is people want to have payback uh, so that people learn lessons. And that's something that happens in Congress, not in the Federal Reserve. Contention number two, the Federal Reserve's tactics work better. Now, when you give a tax credit, that money is, is yours, right? But statistically proven, if you take an economics class, you'll know that that money usually doesn't get spent. Why? Because most people assume that that money's gonna get taxed or, or taken back. You know, when you see, okay, I got a tax credit, but I know how much we're in debt, you know, eventually we're gonna get a politician that's gonna actually, you know, increase taxes and you owe that money. Now, whether or not you do this, majority of people don't spend that money. But when you take a loan out, how many of you take a loan out and don't spend that money? I don't think I need to go any farther than that. Contention number three, public scrutiny is bad. Now, I know they're gonna come up here and say, we need accountability, right? But the reality is, you know, everyone flipped out when we had a $700 billion bailout, right? But hardly any of us can actually describe in economic terms why that's bad. But do you know that since we are in the recession, the Federal Reserve has pumped $7 trillion into the economy? None of you knew anything about that. And that's why we've seen growth, not because of anything Obama has done, so that's why you're going to be voting for us today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister. We'll now hear a speech not to exceed four minutes from the Leader of the Opposition. All right, well, I'm not going to spend my time trying to tell you how clever I am. I'm going to try to show you, and hopefully that will work a little bit better. So what we're looking at here today is that the government is trying to tell you that tax credits are not as good as the Fed just giving money and loans. And uh, first I'm going to address their issues, I'm going to tell you why they're dead wrong, and then I'm going to show you through some other examples why we're right. So first, let's look at the fact that Congress is politicized. Basically what they're saying is that Congress is partisan, they have political leanings. Uh, could anyone in the audience who has no political leanings please raise their hand? Yeah, that's kind of what I thought. Everyone has political leanings. You don't just check them when you enter the Fed. They're appointed by a president. They're appointed by a president because they probably share similar political or at very least fiscal leanings as the president has. So they're going to not leave those behind. Furthermore, they also have their, their own leanings from wherever they started, whether it be conservative or yeah, liberal. Yeah. So you can see right here that this whole concept that they're, that the Congress that, that the Fed is better because they're not partisan doesn't stand up. Further. They say that uh, there's an exemption from retards. Well, first, those are the retards we elected, so evidently they had something going for them that we liked, right? Uh, and secondly, who's to say that the Fed's not exempt from retards? If Congress is retards and our president is a retard because he used to be from Congress, and he appoints somebody to the Fed, what's to say that the president's not a retard and he appointed a retard to the Fed? Okay, this chain of logic just really doesn't follow Question. too very well. Question. Yes. Are you saying Obama is not a retard? I have no comment. <laughs> uh, we're talking about this payback, give and take. You know what? That's how politics works, and it's good because it keeps things from going through that maybe we don't want. There's a checks and balance system for a reason. Our entire government is based on this. And you know, what they're talking about, giving all this power to the Fed, you know what? There, there's no checks and balances there, and that's contrary to what the United States works for. Now, let's move on to their second contention, and that is the Fed tactics work better. Are we still in a recession? Yeah, I think we are. So obviously the Fed's tactics aren't really working that well. Now they talked about the, the bailout bill that, that we were also panicking about. What you don't know, unless you do a lot of research, is that the Fed actually had a bigger bailout plan that went through. They spent more money than Congress, 
but we don't know about it because there's no oversight. There's nobody showing what they do. They get to give all these loans out to companies, and, and we get no say in it. If we don't like what the Fed does, we can't kick them out. We cannot choose to not elect them the next time. There is no accountability to the voters whatsoever. And this is not a good situation for the, the, the fiscal destiny of our nation to be, be in that type of, of hands. Now, further they, further, they go on to say public security is bad. Well, look back at my last argument. Public security is great. Again, our whole foundation of government is based on this concept of transparency. We can see what our political leaders are doing so that if we don't like what they're doing, we cannot elect them next time and try to find somebody who's going to express our views more. This is what a democracy is. So this whole concept that public scrutiny is bad, I think these guys came from Russia or something because, you know, this is kind of something we take to be a, a basic truism here in the United States. Now, let's go on further and look at – I've addressed a lot of this stuff actually. Oh, this whole concept that, that loans are better than credit. Because they said, oh, you know, our, our people don't spend the money they get in this tax credit. Anybody in here still have the money from their tax credit they got the last time around? Because I don't. It's gone. I, I spent that. Uh, and, and a lot of people do. People get mortgages on their homes, and they spend that money to upgrade their home and buy that new car they didn't necessarily need, and maybe go out to dinner a couple times they really didn't need to. Okay, we, we, we are not responsible with our, with our credit. Uh, so these loans that they're talking about giving us, all it's going to do is people are going to take out more loans. This is going to take out more loans they're not going to be fiscally responsible with, and it's going to deepen the recession that we're already in. Tax credits, you can't, you're not going further into debt. This money is yours. You can spend it as you wish. So you can see through all these examples, uh, both my responses to theirs and my additional uh, responses, that really the government doesn't have a leg to stand on. So thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. We're we'll now here in response to this speech and another speech not to exceed four minutes from the member of government. Alrighty. So let's go ahead and address the first point. My partner talked about how Congress is political and how nothing ever gets done. And I think if anyone watched the State of the Union address last night, it was quite entertaining to see the politics that were going on in the room and how one side of the room would literally not clap at anything, even saving lives, and the other side would clap at absolutely everything that they could. I think there was 88 interruptions for applauses during the speech. I don't know why that's happening, but one thing is for sure. It's because they are so divided against each other that they care less about the policies than who they are going to clap for. So let's go ahead and look at the uh, response. Josh said that everyone has a bias, and this is true. Everyone does have a bias, but let's say whether or not there's more of a bias in economics with the Federal Reserve or in Congress. Now, I'd like to point out something, and that's that oftentimes parties switch sides on stances on issues. If you uh, know anything about um, during the 1990s when uh, President Clinton was president, he had a very pro-around-the-world uh, policies, and the Republicans were supposed to be the non-interventionists. We're not going to get involved in any military conflicts. But then during this recent election, Ron Paul was the only Republican that was against getting intervened in other conflicts, and all the Democrats were the non-interventionists. How does that happen? Is it really our ideals, or are they just switching because Bush made a complete mess of all the uh, international affairs? <laughs> so here's my point about economics. If you listen to the State of the Union address, Obama said none of us liked the bailout, and everyone clapped. But then when you listen to the actual policies that they were supporting, both sides uh, supported intervening in the economy with the government. It was just a matter of how much money and where is the money going to go. It wasn't an idealistic basic of, hey, we shouldn't put money into the system because we're free market economists, or hey, we should. So analyzing Congress, it's more about the no party and the yes party not being willing to work together. So now let's compare that bias to the Federal Reserve. Well, the truth is the Federal Reserve doesn't have those sort of divisions. They can agree on policies and get something done. That's why there's a significant less amount of politics going on in the Federal Reserve, because they actually can get, make decisions. 
I'll take your point, Josh. Uh, yeah, wouldn't you say that the give and take and the, the debate that goes back and forth actually produces a better bill in the long run than a hasty one? No, if you look at healthcare, I think the more debate that's going on in healthcare, the more compromises that are being made, the more you have two different ideologies being mixed into one bill that's going to create a bad system. So no, you can't mix politicians in the bills and get a better bill by talking about it, not in our current Congress. Let's go ahead and look at the next arguments about Congress being retards versus the Federal Reserve. Now, I don't know if you guys know, but Ben Bernanke is currently the chairman and he scored a 1600 out of 1600 on his SAT in high school. Not only that, he wrote textbooks on depression, or the Great Depression, not depression, but uh, the Great Depression, <laughs> and he was a teacher of economics. He was appointed by President Bush, and President Obama kept him on. That tells you something about the man who is leading the Federal Reserve. If it was all about politics and the retard who elected him, I'm sure President Obama would have taken advantage of getting rid of someone that Bush elected. But the fact is, Ben Renicki knows what he's doing, he is very smart, and he is the most qualified person right now, according to most politicians, to lead our country. So we stand behind him. Let's go ahead and look next onto the Federal Reserve tactics. And uh, we talked a lot about the bailouts. And here's our argument here. The Federal Reserve did do bailouts. We just didn't hear about them. But the difference is between Congress and the Federal Reserve is that when Congress does a bailout, they decide they want to pump money into the economy, they give it to their special interest groups. There's no scrutiny because they can't stop each other from giving it to certain groups. The Federal Reserve can pump the money where it is needed. Thank you. Thank you, Member of the Government. We'll now hear a speech not to exceed four minutes by the Member of the Opposition. Great. First of all, I'd like to thank you guys for being here, for my partner for being here, and for our opponents for being here as well. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go on to just responding to what Robert was saying about all of these issues. Um, first of all, I'd like to point out that with the Federal Reserve not being accountable, not being able to technically be fired by anyone, <coughs> we see that we do need some sort of control over where they're going to actually spend their money. We definitely need the Congress to figure out where it's all going. Um, we elected these people, even if they do are called retards, we need to make sure that they hold up what we want, where the money is supposed to be going to. We need to make sure that we have a say in where this money is going. We need to make sure that we know about where it's going. They say that they had seven trillion dollars just spent, and I haven't seen it. I haven't heard about it. I don't know where it went. We're still in a recession. We're still here. Um, with Congress actually being able to figure out and help, it, it'll be publicized. We'll be able to know where this money's going. Uh, and that's really the bigger issue here. We'll know where it's going. We'll be able to <coughs> go and vote. We'll be able to say, hey, well, we don't need that there. We need it here. Um, that's what the whole Congress is, a, is about. They're trying to go towards a tyrannical way of thinking. We really need to stay democratic. We need to stay Republican. We need to stay with the pros and cons. We can't just say it's just going. The money's gone. Let's send it there. We need to make sure that Bernanke has some sort of accountability, accountability for what, what he's doing. Yeah, he might be a smart guy, but so are we, right? So are our, con so are our Congress. So are we. We're supposed to know this stuff. Um, he said that he also did not say that um, They dropped a third argument about how Congress does this payback thing. We all do that. We all have our little, will you help me, we'll help them. A helping hand is definitely better than a hand out. That's what we're debating here. We need to make sure that when we're helping each other with uh, this Federal Reserve money, when we figure out how to do this, when Congress has some sort of control over what the money's going to, we can see that'll just be better, that 
the Federal Reserve will work better. We'll be able to have these checks and balances with them and the, um, with our tax credits, that's our money. That's what we'll be getting um, from these small, small business loans. They have to be paid back. With uh, Congress doing these tax credits instead of the Federal Reserve doing just the small business loans, we'll be able to know that that's our money. We'll be able to know where it's going. And um, the, uh, they also dropped their uh, other uh, contention about that the public scrutiny is not needed. Uh, we definitely think that public scrutiny is needed. That's why we have checks and balances. That's why we have Congress. We need to use Congress this way. We need to make sure that our elected officials are doing what we want. We need to make sure that this money that's being given out, handed out in federal um, small business loans, we know where it's going to companies just don't figure out, uh, sign up for it and just get it. We'll be able to figure out how we can help our economy this way with controlling the Federal Reserve through Congress. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. We'll now go back to the leader of the opposition for a rebuttal speech not to exceed three minutes. All right. I don't know about you guys. I like easy decisions. I don't like having to spend all that much time. If it's an easy decision, if it's clear cut, it's good for me. So I'm going to try to show you today, make it real clear cut, why you will be voting against the resolution and in favor of the opposition. The first thing you're going to be voting on today is that the government completely failed to address two of our arguments. Now, if you know much about, about argumentation, you know that silence is consent. If you do not disagree with me when I make a statement, you therefore agree with me. So when the government does not respond to my argument that public scrutiny is good and that giving credit is bad, then they are agreeing with it. They, they didn't respond because they, they know that we're right. We, we present a case that they cannot defeat, so therefore they're going to focus their efforts on other parts and try to beat us there. Though I'm also going to show you that you do so good in that department either. So let's move on to the second issue that you're going to be looking at when you decide today, and that is that of transparency and checks and balances. Now, if you've read our Constitution, if you've taken a political science class, which most of us have to because it's you know, kind of required, um, then you've seen that our government really is based on checks and balances. No one group or individual can do whatever they want. They have to work through other individuals, through other organizations, so that nobody can take control, nobody can push through an agenda of their own that doesn't necessarily coincide with what the rest of our government or the people want. And the government here is trying to show you that that's a bad thing. They want to be able to just push something through. Well, if we just push decisions through, and there's no accountability, we as the American people get no say in it. We may not even know what was what was uh, what decision was picked, and we just have to live with it. And this is completely contrary to American values, especially our political values. And then there's this whole issue of transparency. I want to know where the government's spending my money. Yes, I'm not going to get online and look at every dollar that's spent. But when we're talking about trillions of dollars that are being spent behind closed doors, I want to know about that. Now, let's move on to the third reason, and that is partisanship and retards. Uh, I kind of got the impression they were saying Bush wasn't a retard because they put Bernanke in there, but I'm not really sure. We won't go into that. But I still stand by my argumentation that if you got retards in Congress, you're going to have retards in every aspect of our government. And I don't believe that we have retards in Congress. We have people with multiple PhDs former law professors, former lawyers, some of the best and the brightest in the world become our politicians. They have to be pretty good, or at very least good at lying, to get us to vote for them, right? And, and some of these people have been re-elected time after time after time. They've got to have something going for them more than they look good in the suit, all right? Now, fourth, we're going to talk about the final issue, the most important issue. We are still in a recession, folks. They're trying to tell you that the Fed's tactics are better and that they're working, but we're still there. Furthermore, the Fed's taxes were the same when we got into the recession. You can clearly see that the Fed does not need more control. They need less control. They need more checks and balances because that would benefit us, specifically as the American people and our country as a whole, more than the resolution as it stands. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Richard. We now have another rebuttal from the Prime Minister, not to exceed three minutes. Okay, so I'm just going to sum it up in three main points why I've been studying with us. Over the team that thinks that there's absolutely no one in Congress that doesn't know what they're doing. So
So, okay, let's go ahead and start out with the first one. Now, in response to everything they said against our Congress's politicized argument, I'd just like to point out that we may have been oversimplifying the general actions of the Federal Reserve. Most people in Congress, most people in the United States, don't even know what the Open Market Committee is. Yet, every single day, they buy and sell Treasury securities so that our inflation doesn't shoot up and shoot us into a recession like that in one day. Now, most politicians don't even know that, but they do know, oh, I want more access to power. The Federal Reserve doesn't necessarily bump interest rates up and down with their, their fingertip. They control the federal funds rate, which is the overnight borrowing fee that banks give to each other meeting reserve requirements. That has a direct effect on the amount of interest that they charge on money they loan out. It's not simple for politicians. It's complicated. It's PhD level work. So the reality is, when the average politician isn't going to be able to explain in detail marginal propensity to consume, the consumer price index, M1, M2, M3 data, and, and you know, you got someone versus someone like Pelosi, right, who's now going to be controlling our economy versus someone like Bernanke. And we've already given his qualifications, everyone agrees that Bernanke is the smartest economist in the United States, at least as far as, you know, academic level um, assessments. Secondly, I'd like to point out that you're going to be voting it for us because politics doesn't mix with economics. One is math and the other is persuasion, and that's the reality. You guys should learn that in your speech classes. If Congress can't pass a freaking health care bill, they sure as heck are not going to be able to run the open market committee. Compromises are happening every day in Congress. Your politician that you think is, is somehow not biased is putting pork from people on the left and the right into his bill every time he passes something because that's the only way it happens. Compromises are made in Congress, not in the Federal Reserve. And lastly, I'd just like to point out a bailout comparison. Now, we have a $7 trillion bailout on our side and a $700 billion bailout on their side. And the amount of money has absolutely nothing to do with the effectiveness. When Congress passed a bailout, a lot of that money was going towards pork. They're putting it towards cruise ship spending. When Fed, the Fed passed the bailout, they put it towards the banks. So the only reason your mortgage right now is still existent in America, in a bank that actually speaks English, is because the Federal Reserve bailed that bank out. I don't know, try calling Aquin. They're in India and it's really hard to get anywhere. Okay, so let's move on. The Federal Reserve helps the banks out. Congress doesn't necessarily know what they're doing. The Federal Reserve helps banks out by lowering the interest rate, which has a direct effect on the amount of money that you're able to get. So you, you think that we have low, you know, good housing, okay, so it's a good market to buy a house, right? Is that because Obama passed a new, new buyer tax credit for new buyers? Or is it because the interest rate is no longer 12%, it's at 4.75%? Which do you think has a greater effect? You're talking about $1,000 versus $300,000 on the amount that you're pouring, paying on that mortgage. The reality is that Congress should not be allowed to run our economic policy. You should leave it to the people with the PhDs. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. And then at the end of a debate, certainly the judge decides who wins the debate. And since you are the judges, we want to know who won the debate. So for those of you who support the government, please stand and applaud. And for those of you who support the opposition, please stand and applaud. And for those of you who didn't stand and applaud, have a nice evening, drive safely, and we'll see you in class.